Christ's mission is our mission. There's a reason why our call to share Christ and his gospel is called the Great Commission. Not just another commission, it is the greatest task you will ever be assigned. Do you know that the tremendous blessing of helping somebody walk from darkness into light is an opportunity that we will never have again after we die? Never. There's no lost people in heaven. There's no need for evangelism. You have one chance to be a part of the work of Christ in saving someone's soul. And you're living in that chance right now. Good morning, church. It is a pleasure to be here with you guys this morning. If you have a Bible, if you brought one, I'd invite you to turn with me to Psalm 37, verse 4. If you came this morning and you don't own a Bible, there should be one under the chair in front of you. And if that's you, grab that, follow along with us this morning, and then I ask that you take that Bible home with you. It's yours to keep. That is our gift to you uh, as a thank you for joining us for service this morning. My name is Christian Conway. I am the middle school and college director here at Coastal Church, and it is an awesome thing to work with some of the young people in God's church. I know that we have some kids with us in service this morning, and so I'm going to talk to you guys for just a second, just to the kids. If you're a kid in this room, I want you to show me with your fingers, show me what grade you're in this year. First grade, one finger. Fifth grade, be five fingers. All right. Now, once you have it up, I want you to look at how many fingers you have up, and that's how many things I want you to remember from this morning's sermon. So if you're in third grade, I want you to remember three things that I say during my message. And then parents, you guys are going to need to help me with this. You guys are going to be the ones who quiz them in the car ride home and see if they were able to remember all of their things, middle schoolers and high schoolers included. So already to all the 12th graders, I'm sorry. I don't know how you guys are going to do it, but best of luck to you. But it is awesome to be with you guys this morning. We have a really beautiful passage before us this morning. And it's December 31st, the end of the year. We have an opportunity to look back on 2023, all the things that happened, all the highs and the lows. And I know that every person in this room can think of really, really great things that happened in 2023, moments of victory where you were celebrating with your brothers and sisters. But everybody in this room can also think of difficult things that happened in 2023. Maybe there was something that didn't go exactly how you had planned. Maybe you lost a loved one this year. We've all had really highs, high highs and low lows this year. But for just a second, if you could, I ask you to put those, those hard memories out of your mind for just a second. And let's think about the good things, the greatest things that brought us the most joy from 2023. I want you to think about those things and think specifically about any people or places or activities that come up again and again and again in those memories. Are there any maybe loved ones around you that are constantly by your side in the best moments? Or maybe there's a place that every time you go to this place, you just feel awesome joy. Maybe there's an activity that you love doing. For me, that's it. For me, this is a really silly example, but when I think back on 2023, some of my most fun memories come from playing a new sport that I found called pickleball. And For those of you who don't know, pickleball is like tennis for people who can't play tennis. And I'm proudly one of those people, but it's so much fun. And I found that one of the reasons I've enjoyed it so much is because the people closest to me, some of my closest friends and family members, they actually go out and play with me. They're the ones who introduced me to the sport. And it's so much fun to go out on a weekend and play with them. And because I'm surrounded by people who play it and enjoy it, and when I go out, I meet more people who play it and enjoy it, it's really easy for me to delight in pickleball because I'm surrounded by people who do the same thing. And so this morning, Whatever that thing was for you, whoever it was or wherever it was, I want you to think about that thing. And then my challenge for you this morning is how can we make God just like that thing or that person in your life? In 2024, how can we make God the person who comes up again and again in your best memories, your most joyful times in 2024? How can we make sure that God is at the center of those? And this morning, We're going to talk about that in our verse. It's a very simple verse, just one verse we're covering this morning, but I think it has lots of deep truth for us to understand. It's not complicated. It's very simple, but the Lord has something for us this morning. So follow along as I read Psalm 37, verse 4. David says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. There's a very simple truth there. This is the title of our message this morning. It's the first point in our message this morning. God wants us to delight in the Lord. God wants us to delight in the Lord. And this isn't what the world tells us. The world actually kind of thinks of it as if there's two groups of people in the world. There's the holy people, and then there's the happy people. And if you, want to, if you want to join the church and become one of the holy people, you have to decide to put away happiness in the world and, and put away all the things that are fun and enjoyable and go follow God instead. And that's not an accident. Because Satan, deep down, knows that following God is a delightful thing. It's a joyful thing. And so in order to get our eyes off of following God, he has to try to convince us that the sins in our life are more enjoyable, more delightful than God is. And so he tries to create this false decision that we have to choose between being happy or being holy. And brothers and sisters, this morning I'm here to tell you, God wants us to be happy and holy. God's designed it for us to live a holy life and for joy to come along with that. And so this morning I hope for us to understand how this is by studying Psalm 37 verse 4. And so we have to understand that this, this decision that the world tries to make us feel like we have to make is it couldn't be further from the truth. And there's a couple of scriptures that help us understand, understand this message. But before we get to that, I want us to start at the very, very basics. If you've been around Coastal for any length of time, you've heard this word before. If you're new here, welcome. We're going to talk about the gospel. The word gospel is very simple. It means good news. And it's talking about the good news that we have in the Bible. The good news, and as I, as I explain this good news, I want you to think to yourself, is this a delightful and enjoyable message? Or is this a difficult and burden, burdensome message? The gospel is the news that you and I are sinners. We've rejected God and his commands. We've rejected his character. We've turned away from him. And because of that, every single one of us deserves death. But in the midst of that, knowing that, God stepped in. He took on flesh, became a man, Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life, which none of us could do. And then instead of waltzing off into eternity all on his own, he offered that to us. He gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. He paid the penalty that we owe so that we can have eternal life with God, the gift that only he could offer. He offers this if we do three simple things. If we repent from our sins, turn away from our sins, Believe in Jesus Christ and receive him into our life. That's all we have to do. And we receive this eternal life, which we don't deserve, but he's chosen to graciously give it to us in our lives. Now that is a joyful message. That's a delightful message. And God wants us to know that through his word. We see this in the book of Philippians. The apostle Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. And this is what he says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. He wants them to know that the gospel is something we should rejoice in. And please understand my heart behind saying this. As we go through this this morning, if you're somebody who came in here this morning and you're finding it really difficult to rejoice in the Lord, maybe this is a season where you're just, you can't find a way to, to combine God and delight in the same sentence. If that's you, know that I'm not, I'm not trying to shame you. I'm not trying to tell you that you're wrong. I'm not trying to tell you that you should be better. In fact, this message is designed for people who are going through that right now. I have gone through seasons of that. Even even every day I have moments where it's hard to, to enjoy the things that God gives me because the things of the world seem so much more pleasurable. They seem so much more enticing. But I have to convince myself day after day, remind myself that God is the one worth pursuing. That real joy, eternal joy, is found at God's side and nowhere else. And so if that's you this morning, I want you to tune in and understand that God has something in his word for us, but specifically for you this morning, that he wants us to delight in him. So this morning we're studying Psalm 37, 4, which was written by David. It's one of his psalms. There's a couple other psalms that David wrote where he brings this same idea to the forefront, this idea of of finding joy in God. 
One of the examples is Psalm 4, 7. And this is one of the coolest verses about joy in the Bible. David says, you, talking to God, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. He's saying that when everything goes right for the world and they have everything that they can offer, God's joy is more. Again, in Psalm 1611, David says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David is giving us an opportunity to remember in these different Psalms that he's writing that God is the place where we can find our joy. Think about that last verse. There is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What would fullness of joy look like in your life in 2024? What would it look like if you could live your life and you knew that whatever circumstances you found yourself in, that God's joy was available to you? And that whatever twists and turns came along the way, that God was right there beside you. God is in control of the situation. And even when it seems like things are out of control, God is the one who's by your side. How would your life look different if you were able to remember this day after day when challenges come and troubles come in 2024? Joy is found at the right hand of God. And we see this, God gives us joy differently than the world does. You see, the world, when they want, when they're telling you to go find joy, it's figure out what circumstances bring you joy and then go chase after those circumstances. So maybe family is the thing that brings you joy. Well, if that's the case, you better work hard, retire, and then one day you can spend your time with your family. Or maybe money is the thing that brings you joy. And if that's the case, then go work hard, retire, build a good retirement, and then you can find joy in your money. Maybe food is the thing that brings you joy. Guilty as charged. And then you spend your entire life chasing after the next best meal, and you only find joy when you're in those situations. But instead of telling us to go chase after joyful situations, God does it differently. God reminds us that he is the source of our joy and we can bring that joy into whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. This is letter A in your notes that God wants us to bring joy to every circumstance. Bring joy to every circumstance. The thing about God is that he is always with us. Regardless of whether you're on a mountaintop or at the bottom of a valley, God is there for you. And if you need access to his joy, his infinite joy is right there. It's at a moment's notice, at an instant, you can have access to God's infinite joy, regardless of what circumstance you're in. This is why Christians can say things like Paul says in Romans 5. He says, through him, talking about Jesus Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And listen to this. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. If you're following joy the way that the world follows joy, you're chasing after it, trying to go to the joyful circumstances, you're not able to say that you can rejoice in your sufferings like Paul does here in Romans 5. It's only if you remember that the infinite source of joy is at your side day and night that you can have access to his joy even when you're suffering. And as I was going through my devotions this week, reading through um, some Old Testament passages, I came across a story where God's people does this exact thing. They find themselves in a hard situation and they have access to God's joy and they bring joy into a situation that should not be joyful. I was in 2 Chronicles in verses 20 or chapter 27 and 28, they have this evil king named Ahaz. And Ahaz follows, prof, or follows false prophets and false gods. He took down all of the things that God commanded his people to keep. And he started, he started building idols and altars and false temples to all these fake gods. And God rewarded him by allowing Judah to be destroyed in battle and then captives taken off to Syria. And so things weren't going very well for for the Jews when this was happening. But in the midst of it, God gave them a new king, Ahaz's son. His name was Hezekiah. Hezekiah came along and realized that the things his dad was doing were against the commands of God. He was doing all of the things God told them not to do, and he was forsaking all the things that God was telling them to do. 
So Hezekiah realized that God repaid him by allowing Judah to be defeated in battle and taken off as captives. So maybe the right thing to do is put away all those false gods and pull back the things that God had commanded them to do. So he started rebuilding the temple and replacing the tools that they needed for worship. He made sure that there were priests and Levites to fund and to make sure that everything was going on in the temple as God commanded. And then he pulled out the law and he saw law after law after law that Judah had not been following. They had just put them to the side and ignored them. And so he decided on one. He wanted to find one command that the entire country could follow together. And he found one, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He decided that he wanted all of Judah to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread together because that's one of the commands that God gave them. And so he sent messengers to the whole country and said, we're going to do this. When this time comes, we're going to spend seven days feasting in Jerusalem for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's an opportunity for God's people to celebrate what he's given them and to rejoice in him. So the time comes, they, they celebrate. And in first, or Second Chronicles 30, this is what it says. It says, The people of Israel who were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread for seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with all their might to the Lord. So they, for seven days, they, they declare this feast. They do the whole thing. And let's see how they reacted because They didn't treat this obedience as if it was a burden and something that, oh, I guess we got to do that. That might have been how they went into it since they hadn't done it in decades. But by the end of the seven days, after obeying God for seven days in this feast, listen to how they respond. Just two verses later, after they finished the seven days, it says, Then the whole assembly agreed together to keep the feast for another seven days. So they kept it for another seven days with gladness. They got to the end of the seven days and realized we have been missing out on something so sweet. Let's do it again. They wanted more of of God's commands in their life because they realized that God's commands are actually beneficial for them. It's not these chains that they have to wear as they live through life. It's actually freedom that God gives them to celebrate and to enjoy the things that he's given them. And so one of my questions for you this morning, what is the feast of unleavened bread in your life? What's the thing that God's been commanding you to do that you've been putting off to the side? Maybe later, God. I don't need that right now because I have all these other things going and that would just be too much on my plate. If you did what God called you to do and experienced the joy that comes from that, do you think you'd want to keep it off to the side or do you think you'd want to make that a regular part of your life? What is your feast of unleavened bread? C.S. Lewis, one of the great Christian authors of the 20th century, many of you know him as the the guy who wrote Chronicles of Narnia. He had another book, and in this book, he wrote a quote about joy, and I want you to listen to this really carefully and see if it applies to your life. C.S. Lewis says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. What is the mud pie in your life that you're choosing over God? Just a minute ago, we talked about the Feast of Unleavened Bread where God commanded them, but for years and years and years, they had distractions in their life that kept them from obeying God. What is the thing in your life? It might even be a good thing. Sometimes our distractions aren't necessarily sinful. There's something good, but it's less good than what God has to offer you. What are the mud pies in your life, the things that are keeping you occupied, but are taking your eyes off of the infinite joy that God has to offer? If you understood the infinite joy and tasted of that infinite joy, do you think you would still want the mud pie? Or do you think you would put it down and turn to the holiday at sea that God is offering? Now that we've seen how the joy that God offers is different than the joy that the world offers, I want us to turn our attention to the second part of the verse. The verse says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So we talked about finding joy in God and delighting ourselves in the Lord. Now we're going to see that God rewards those who delight in him. Number two in your notes, God rewards faithfulness. 
And this, similar to the joy, this reward that God gives is different than what the world rewards. God rewards faithfulness, but the world rewards other things. For example, I'm sure there's many people in this room who go to work day after day, and you're striving, you're working faithfully, every day doing what's asked of you, helping push forward the success of your company as much as you can. Maybe you've been there for years and years and years. But the reality about our world is that tomorrow, or the next day, because it's not a holiday, January 2nd, somebody walks in, a young buck walks in, and does your job better than you, faster than you, cheaper than you. Your company's going to kick you to the curb and invite this young buck to come do what you've been doing. Because the world rewards success while God rewards faithfulness. In a, we can take a Christian example of this. There's many men throughout history who have gone hundreds or even thousands of times, proclaimed the name of Jesus, and people have been saved through their ministries, but their ministries were separated from prayer. They didn't invite God into their ministries. Those men, even though they had lots of success, and from the world's perspective, it was a really awesome, wildly successful life. Those men aren't going to be rewarded half as much as the poor widow who every day got on her knees and begged God to intervene in her life. Because God doesn't always look at the the success that we have in our lives. He looks at the faithfulness that we have toward him. It reminds me, um, a couple years ago, I was at a college football game. I'm a huge football fan. We were at this game, and, and one thing you wouldn't know if you have never been to a football game in person is before the games, lots of players have this tradition where they go to the end zone and they pray before the game. It's an awesome thing to see. They don't show it on television, so you have to be there in person to see it. But it's one of my favorite parts of being in a football game. So my friends and I were sitting in the stands watching this game. It hasn't even started yet, but there were players praying in the end zone. And there were two teams. One of the teams, the entire team was circled up praying in the end zone together. While on the other team, there were a couple players in the end zone praying, but the rest of them were getting around in a circle on the sidelines, getting hyped. They were playing music. They were getting ready for the game, getting pumped up. My friend looked at me and said, I'm way more afraid of that team that's on their knees in the end zone right now than I am of the team that's hyping themselves up for this game. He didn't look at how fast these players could run 40 yards. He didn't look at how many times they could bench press 225 pounds. He didn't care about how tall they were, how big they were. He recognized that the real strength comes from faithfulness to God and not the accolades that this world has to offer. Is that how we treat our lives? I know that I can definitely say there have been seasons of my life where I've ignored that side of things. I've been too focused on the things that are right in front of me that I forget to pay attention to my faithfulness to God. Let me give you this challenge. If everybody at this church was exactly as faithful as you are, what would our church look like? If everybody prayed as much as you do, went to small group as much as you do, read God's word as much as you do, what would our church look like? Would we be thriving, running on spiritual octane, a church that's reaching the nations for the gospel? Or would we be running on fumes, barely surviving because we're living our lives and running our church separated from God? That's a sobering question to ask yourself. I remember a couple years ago, I asked myself that same question. And I, I came to a scary realization. I realized, that, I realized that even though I was reading God's word and I was praying every now and then, I wasn't I wasn't really in it. I was praying because I knew that I had to, and I was reading God's word, but I wasn't doing anything about what I was reading on the page. So from the outside, it would have looked fine. It would have looked like my life was going great, and I was faithful to the Lord. But I knew that I wasn't really giving myself to those things. I knew that I was was doing them because I had to, not because I wanted to, not because I thought they were going to make a difference. And that's when I realized that I needed to change. And maybe that's some of you right now thinking through that, saying, I don't, I don't know if I'm living the life of faithfulness that God's calling me to. And if that's you, I want you to know it is not too late to change. We're starting a new year, 2024. This can be the year where you focus on faithfulness to the Lord. This can be the year where you devote yourself to prayer or you devote yourself to God's word. Whatever it is, this can be the year of change. Now, one more thing about God's rewards that makes his rewards different than the world's 
is that we don't seek God's rewards because they're valuable by themselves. When we think about the new heaven and the new earth that's described for us in Revelation, we read about the gold streets that we're walking on, and we read about the gates that are made of pearls and, and precious gemstones. We don't, we're not supposed to desire that because the streets are made of a precious metal and the gates are made of pearls. We, as Christians, we desire that because that gives us access to the presence of God. If God wasn't in heaven, it wouldn't be heaven. You can put as many precious metals as you want there. If God's not there, it's not nearly as desirable. We desire those things because they're God's, not because they're valuable by themselves. And so when God gives us rewards, they're valuable because they're his. And if we set our minds, if we tune our minds to understand that, then we are going to seek after his rewards so much more. And it's a really, really sweet thing. <clears throat> now, as we finish, I want to talk one more thing about God's rewards. This brings us to the very end of the verse. This is your third point in your notes. His rewards align with a pure heart. His rewards align with a pure heart. Now, what am I talking about when I say this? We look at this verse, and if you've been following along to this point, <clears throat> we're talking about somebody who delights himself in the Lord and who is being rewarded by God. And so think about this person who finds joy in God and delights themselves in God. Think about the things that they would do with their time and the things that they would really put their focus on. Now think about that person. What types of things do you think they desire? Because it says that God will give you the desires of your heart. But that's not the only part of the verse that follows delight yourself in the Lord. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, God will give us the desires of our hearts. And this leads me to one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible that talks about prayer. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. The Apostle John says this about prayer. He says, This is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests we've asked of him. And so when I first heard this verse, I misunderstood it. I thought to myself, great, so you're telling me that if I pray exactly what God was already planning to do in his will, then he'll answer me. Yay. I, I, I wasn't getting it. I was like, okay, that doesn't really move the needle for me because you're telling me that God's going to do what he's going to do. And if I ask for it, yay. If I don't ask for it, I don't get it. But I didn't understand the heart of this verse. I didn't understand why God is answering the prayers that are in accordance with his will and ignoring the prayers that are outside of his will. To help us understand this better, I want us to think about this in relation to the parable that Jesus told about the wide path and the narrow path. Jesus told a parable about this wide path that many people will take, but that path led to destruction. And then on the other hand, there was this narrow path that was really hard and difficult to follow. Only a few people would go down this path, but that was the path that led to life. If we live our lives walking down the wide path that leads to destruction, God is not going to grant us success at every turn down that path. Think about it. The most unloving thing that God could do if we're walking down the wide path toward destruction is help us along the way. The most unloving thing he could do is help us get to our destruction quicker. Because of his love for us, he's going to put roadblocks in the way between us and destruction. This reminds me of one of the verses that Pastor Andrew quotes all the time, and I think he does it for good reason. It's an amazing verse. James 4, 6 said, says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we'll take this in two parts. The first part is letter A on your notes. Very simply, God opposes the proud. If you're living a proud life that's focused on you and not focused on God, God's not going to grant you success on that path. He's going to oppose you, as James says in this passage. He wants to hinder us on our journey toward destruction in hopes that he might open our eyes to realize we're on the wrong path. And before we get to destruction, have an opportunity by his grace to turn around. And don't mishear me here. I'm not talking about the, the idea that 
that uh, works lead to salvation. It's not that you're, you're choosing the path you're on, and if you do good enough things, you can follow the path to God. The Bible tells us very clearly that it is by grace you are saved and not of your own works. Those who take the narrow path have received God's grace and had their eyes open to see that that is the path that he's calling us down, where he offers eternal life. And think about the people who are following that path. Letter B in your notes, I'm sure you can guess it, God gives grace to the humble. And so for those people who are walking down the narrow path that's difficult to go down, God's going to give them success on their journey. He's going to give them the opportunity to have ease around certain corners so that they can make it to life. And so knowing these two things, knowing that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, I want you to ask yourself this question. Right now, December 31st, 2023, is God opposing me in the plans that I'm making and the actions that I'm taking? Or is he giving me grace? Does it feel like every time you turn around a corner, God's putting another obstacle in your way? Or does it feel like God's blessing your actions right now? He's blessing your path. If, if it does feel like he has obstacles in your way, the best thing that you can do is seek him. Say, God, I know that you oppose the proud and it seems like you might be opposing me and my path right now. Please help me to find you. If I'm on the wrong path, make that very clear to me and show me how I can turn around and go on your path in obedience to you. Help me to seek you, God. If it seems like God's having grace in your life, pray the same prayer. God, it seems like you're, you're having grace on me and you're making my path straight and you're helping me down this path. Please, Lord, if I'm on the right path, continue to do that. If I'm on the wrong path, make that clear to me and help me to follow your path even closer. Every time I make a misstep, Lord, would you be there to put me back on the right direction? God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And so as we close, I have one exercise, one last exercise for all of us to do. And so I'd love for you to grab a pen or a phone, something you can write with. If you don't have a pen, you can grab your neighbor's pen. Something you can write down with, grab a piece of paper. And I want you to answer this question. If someone who doesn't know you would come into your life and they had access to your calendar, they had access to your checkbook, and they could watch every move that you made. Simply based on that information, where would they think your desire comes from? What types of activities and things would they think that you're pursuing with your time, talent, and treasure in your life? So as you're thinking about those, I want you to write them down, maybe two or three things that would be very clear to them that you're valuing these things because you spend lots of money on it, because you spend lots of time doing it, because you use your talents for that thing very often. Two or three things. I'll give you guys just a second to write those down, and then I have a question uh, to ask us about that. So I'll give you a second here to write those two or three things down. All right. Hopefully by now we have two or three, maybe just one thing on the paper. Whatever you have in front of you, I want you to look at those things and I want you to ask yourself this question. A hundred years from now, when I've passed on and everything has passed on with me and I'm looking back on these three things, am I going to be proud of how I spent my time, talent, and treasure? Was I pursuing the Lord, making an eternal impact? Or will all three of these things pass away with me? Better yet, when you're standing before God on judgment day and he brings up these things to you and says, I saw you spent a lot of time, talent, and treasure doing these things in 2023. Are you going to be happy and excited to tell him about those things, the gospel impact that you were making, how you were making an eternal difference with the resources that he gave you? Or are you going to sheepishly turn away and hope that he skips over that part really quickly because you don't want to answer for the things that you were spending your time on? Maybe they weren't bad, but they definitely didn't have an eternal impact on anybody's life. Think about those things because, again, we're entering a new year. 2024 is right around the corner, and if that's you, there is time to change that. 
If you want to commit your 2024 to being a year where you follow after God, you desire the things that he has for you, and you desire him, the opportunity is right in front of you. If, if that's the life that you have been living and you're really excited about the things that you wrote on that paper, continue to grow in those in 2024. And thinking back to the very beginning, we talked about what things or people or places continually come up in our best memories and how we can make God one of those for me, I reflected back and realized that one of the reasons I like pickleball is because I've surrounded myself with people who like it and talk about it and enjoy the same thing that I do. And so it's really easy for me to continue to delight in it because I'm surrounded by people who do that. Maybe that's a challenge for you to surround yourself with people who love God and desire him, a community that's going to push you closer to God. Whatever that step is that you need to take in 2024 to desire God more, to pursue him better, this is a perfect opportunity to take that. And so I'm going to invite the prayer team up. They're going to stand under the, the screens here at the side of the stage. And if you need prayer about how you can seek God better in 2024, these are the people to talk to. They will talk with you. They will pray with you. They will help you see the areas that you need to make a change in your life in 2024. And if they don't know the exact area, if they can't give you the pinpoint, they can help you seek God who will do the same thing. Surround ourselves with community in 2024. Let's make 2024 a year where the world looks at Coastal Church. They see people who truly delight in the Lord and they want what we have. Let's let our lives be defined by delight and a joy that comes from God. Let me pray for us as we go out this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we need you. Lord, we, we don't always desire you. It's not the natural tendency. It's not the, the thing that comes easiest to us. But we need you. We want to want you, Lord. Would you help us to desire you and to delight in the things that you delight in? Help us to find joy in the things that bring you joy so that we can align our hearts with yours. We can delight in you. And then you'll give us the desires of our heart. Lord, would you help the desires of my heart to be in line with yours? Lord, I can't do this on my own. I can't fight this fight on my own. I need you. We need you. And together we ask that you'll intercede in our lives. Lord, together we trust that you'll hear this prayer and you'll answer it. Together we believe that what you have for us in 2024 is the best thing for us. So we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your grace and your mercy every step of the way. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray.